2005, about this time of the year, I was driving around Cleveland on 480 when my phone rang. And this was before people would spam call you. I didn't know the number, but I picked it up anyway. And the lady on the other end said that she was with the Kent State newspaper. She said that she found my name through a database which identified me as a student representative for Campus Crusade for Christ. I said, that's right. She said that she was doing an article on Easter and she wondered if she could ask me a few questions about Easter and about the significance of the holiday. I said, sure. I said, I'd love to talk about Easter. I told her that Easter is the time when Christians around the world take time to remember that Jesus died for our sins. And I said that we believe on the cross, God the Father poured out his wrath for our sins on his Son. And because God the Father poured out his wrath for our sins on his son, we who should be counted as guilty can be counted as not guilty. And I'm driving on 480, and I thought to myself, that's a solid answer. I took a cold call, no preparation. I've got one hand on the wheel and one hand on the phone, and that was a decent answer. But the lady on the other end is not impressed. And she says, no. No. She said, that's not Easter. That's Good Friday. You told me all about what happened on Friday, but I want to know about Easter. I want to know what happened on Sunday. And I said, well, Jesus rose from the dead on Easter. And she said, that's what I'm asking. Why is that so important? And I said, well, he rose because he died. And then I said it like three more times in slightly different ways, hoping that somehow more meaning would come to that. And after about the third time of me saying, well, he rose because he died, she said, I think I have all that I need. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't really understand Easter. I don't really understand the resurrection nearly as much as I thought I did. Now, I knew that it meant something. And I knew that Easter was important. But the significance and how important, I wasn't quite sure. My prayer this morning is that we see with clarity all that the resurrection means for us. Let's pray for his help. Father God, we pray for help in understanding this morning. Father, we pray that you would teach us what the resurrection means. We pray that you would lead us into truth, and we pray that your truth would change our very lives. And Father God, only you can do these things. And so we pray for your help. We pray for your help in hearing we pray that you would open our ears. We pray for your hope in, help in seeing. We pray that you'd open our spiritual eyes. Father, we pray for your help in speaking. We pray that you would bless these words and that these words would be your words. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So I invite you to turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians 15. If you want to use the Red Pew Bible in front of you, you can find this on page 815. 815. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, although some who have fallen asleep. 
Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as to the one abnormally born. We're talking about the resurrection this morning. That's verse 4. He was raised to life on the third day. He died, and then he was raised. If you're taking notes this morning, two questions to guide our time. Question number one, what happened? That's question number one, what happened? And then question number two, what does it mean? What does it mean? So first question, what happened? Some 2,000 years ago, Jesus was raised from the dead. That's what we celebrate this morning. We celebrate that the Jesus Christ, the Messiah who died, was raised to life and now lives again. That was our scripture reading this moments ago. The women go to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. But the body of Jesus isn't in the tomb. And the angel says, Jesus, the one you are looking for is risen from the dead. He died, but now he is risen. Now there's no doubt that Jesus died. So on the cross, a condemned man would hang forward. And the only way to breathe would be to pull yourself back and to push yourself up. And so after a while, the condemned man would stop moving. And after a while, the condemned man would stop gasping for air. And so the centurion would take a spear at that moment and shove it through the side, going through the stomach the lungs and the heart, just to make sure that he was dead. Crucifixion leaves no doubt that the condemned man is dead. So Jesus lived, he died, there's no doubt about it. But that's not all we believe. We believe that on Sunday morning, Easter morning, that Jesus was raised to life, that Jesus lives again. Now, for many, this is simply too fantastic. And for many, the resurrection is simply too impossible to believe. And if you're like me, this week something came across your path proclaiming that the Bible is wrong and that Christianity is wrong and that Jesus never really rose from the dead. And that's not surprising at all. Because throughout history, people have said things like this. And throughout history, people have said, dead men don't rise. And throughout history, people have said, that's nothing more than a lie or a legend. And throughout history, people have said, the resurrection is impossible. But it's not a legend. And it's not a lie. The resurrection is fact. And we know the resurrection happened. And we know that Jesus really and truly rose from the dead because of verses 5 through 8. Paul lists all of these people whom Jesus appeared to after he was dead and then raised. Verse 5, he appeared to Peter, then to the 11 disciples. Verse 6, then he appeared to more than 500 people. And then verse 8, he appeared to Paul. Paul lists all of these people as if to say, just go ask them. You know these people. Go ask them if Jesus Christ was really raised from the dead. Go ask them if they really saw the risen Savior. Chuck Colson was the hatchet man for the Nixon administration in the 70s. And like a mobster, Colson would take care of the problems. And he would take care of these problems by threat or violence. Whatever the problem, he'd take care of it. But what Colson was most famous for was being a part of the Watergate 7. And Colson was instrumental in the Watergate scandal. And before the trial, Colson gets together with the other six, and they go over every detail of their story. And they went over 
every detail so that they'd get the lie exactly right so that no one would bumble it. So the same details, the same order of events, the same people to blame. And yet when push comes to shove, and when jail time was on the line, all of these seven men cracked. And under the pressure of jail, the truth came out. But these men, in 1 Corinthians 15, these 500 kept their story to the end. And not under the pressure of jail, but under the pressure of death. And many of these people who said, yes, Jesus rose from the dead, they paid for that statement with their very life. And all they had to do was recant. And all they had to do was say, no, this is a lie, this is a myth, we're just making it up, we're just some crazy fanatics. All they had to do was recant and they could keep their life. But they didn't change their story because they couldn't change the story because the story they proclaimed is the story that actually happened. Chuck Colson went on to become a Christian. And he became a Christian because of this passage in 1 Corinthians 15. And Chuck Colson said, if a few men couldn't keep a lie for a few days, the very fact that 500 people kept their story for all of their life, even giving their life, means one thing and only one thing. The resurrection is settled fact. And here's what Colson came to realize. If Jesus really rose from the dead, that sets him apart from every other religious teacher and from every other religion. So second question then, what does that mean? It means everything. The resurrection is the defining aspect of our faith. The Apostle Paul says, verse 3, the resurrection is of first importance. He said, there's nothing more important than the resurrection because the resurrection is our faith. The resurrection means at least three things, and we're going to go over them here. Number one, the resurrection means that our sins are paid in full. Without the resurrection, the cross means nothing. On the cross, Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. And we saw that last week. And we saw last week that Jesus became our sins. And our sins were placed upon him. And God the Father punished his own son instead of punishing us. That's what the cross is all about. But then, but then on the third day, Jesus was raised from the dead. And Jesus was raised from the dead because God the Father is no longer holding our sins against Jesus. God the Father is raised from the dead because no punishment for sin remains, meaning that our sins are paid for in full. My kids, like all kids, sometimes do the wrong thing. And sometimes for that wrongdoing, they are put in time out. And yet after a time, Maria and I let the kids out of timeout because the punishment is served. Jesus is raised from the dead as validation that God the Father is no longer holding our sins against Jesus. His resurrection is validation that our sins are paid for in full. And if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, well, then verse 17, our faith is futile. If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, there's no validations that our sin are paid for. And if our sins aren't paid for, then there's no hope. But of course, that's not what happened. Jesus was raised from the dead. And he was raised from the dead as a massive statement. Your sins are paid for in full. The resurrection is the heart of the Christian message. Our hope and our only hope is that Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. 
And because he paid the penalty for our sins, we can have peace with God and access to God. And just so that we see how important this is, look down at verse 19. Paul says, if Jesus Christ isn't raised from the dead, then I'm the most pitied of all men. Paul says of his own life, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, then all that I've done is worthless. And that's a shocking statement. Paul is the guy, verse 10, who has done more for Christianity than any other person other than Jesus Christ. Paul writes about half of the New Testament. And Paul travels all around the region telling people about Jesus. And Paul tells all these people things like, Jesus is the way to have peace. And Jesus is the way to have joy. And Jesus is the way to have a good marriage. And Jesus is the way to be a good father or a good mother. Paul spends his life declaring all of the things that Jesus taught. And yet he says in verse 19, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, none of that matters. Jesus isn't raised from the dead. None of that matters. Because following the teachings of Jesus is never enough to earn salvation. That's what Paul said. Following the teachings of Jesus is never enough to earn salvation. Peace with God and access to God comes only one way, and that is through the death of and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul says, my hope and my only hope is that Jesus died and rose again. The resurrection is validation that our sins are paid for in full. Number two, the resurrection shows us that all things will become new. All things new. Jesus was raised to newness of life. And his newness of life is extended to his followers. The resurrection, verse 20, is the first fruit. The first of what is to come. Now maybe your yard is like my yard at home. And we have one of those trees in our yard that any day now is going to get the first pink flower on it. And we know that when the first pink flower appears, that there's going to be many more flowers on that tree. Jesus is like that. He's the first fruit. Jesus is the first, meaning that soon we can expect to see many other resurrections. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we expect every follower of Christ to follow in his resurrection. Jesus is simply the first in a long line of what is to transpire. And what is to come? The full harvest, if you will, is complete resurrection. There is coming a day in which Jesus will make all things new. His resurrection will be so complete that he will raise the Christian and he will recreate the cosmos. There is coming a day, verse 24, when Jesus will hand over the kingdom of God and Jesus will restore and Jesus will recreate all things to the way that they are intended to be. The resurrection of Jesus is simply the first in a long line of all that is to come. Christians will pass away only to be brought back to newness of life. And the heavens and the earth will pass away only to be brought back to newness of life. His resurrection means there is coming a day of new life and new heavens and new earth. His resurrection means that there is coming a day of recreation of all things to be good and right. And his resurrection is the guarantee that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And neither will there be death or mourning, for the old order of things will have passed away. His resurrection foretells his promise. He will make all things new. 
His resurrection is simply the first. The first of all things new. This day we celebrate the rising of Jesus from the dead. And this day we look forward to the raising of this body. And we look forward to the renewal of the earth. And we look forward to bodies that function as intended. And we look forward to a world that functions as designed. We long for all things to be new. And that's not theoretical. That's not abstract. Many of us here have lost loved ones. And maybe even lost a loved one this year. Some of us here are struggling with sickness. Some of us here have chronic pain. Some of us here are in incredible difficulty. Others of us are overwhelmed by disappointment. And whatever the pain, whatever the struggle, whatever the loss, whatever the difficulty, whatever the disappointment, there is coming a resurrection. And his resurrection in the past is our certain hope of the future that he will make all things new. And finally, the resurrection shows us that Number three, victory is assured. In the Bible, Jesus promises all of these victories over his enemies. And we see one of these promises in verse 25. Jesus promises to put all of his enemies under his feet. And Jesus promises to destroy all things that are in not step or in not keeping with his good plan. And so Jesus literally promises, I'm going to destroy cancer and car crashes. I'm going to destroy sickness and suffering. I'm going to destroy problems and pain. I'm going to destroy disappointments and divorces. And verse 55, he will even destroy death itself. Those are incredible promises. And this morning we can say those promises are true. And this morning we can say victory is assured because Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. You see, on the cross, the forces of hell unleashed their best. The forces of hell filled Judas with greed. The forces of hell filled the apostles with fear. The forces of hell filled the crowd with hate. The forces of hell filled Pilate with cowardice. The forces of hell filled the soldiers with scorn. The forces of hell unleashed everything they had. They unleashed the full fury of their wrath. And for a moment, it seemed as though they were about to be successful. Jesus died and was buried. But he didn't stay dead. On Sunday morning, he rose from the dead. And his rising brings assurance of victory because if you can't kill him, then you can't stop him. The resurrection is the ultimate symbol that no one and no thing, not even the forces of hell, can stop our God. And get this. When Jesus' body was in the tomb, Jesus wasn't asleep. His spirit was in hell preaching to those very demons, 1 Peter chapter 3. His holy body was lying in the grave, and yet his spirit went to the depths of hell to preach to these spirits in prison, to proclaim all that you did meant nothing. The resurrection of Christ is a Christ who declares, I will be because I have been victorious over all things. And his victory is not for Christ alone. His victory is for any and all who follow him. Look at verse 55. Oh, death, where is your sting? For the believer. Death is nothing but a closing of the eyes and awakening to the 
new life to come. The wonder of the resurrection is that the event that happened in the past guarantees our victory in the future. And so this morning, let the glory and the hope of the resurrection set in. And so despite what the news says, and despite what the doctor says, and despite what our family says, and despite what our co-worker says, there is coming victory. And we know that victory is assured because neither death nor the forces of hell have any impact on Jesus. He is risen, and he is risen indeed. I was driving through Cleveland, and the phone rang. Can you tell me the meaning of Easter? Can you tell me why it's so significant that Jesus was raised from the dead? And I couldn't do it. I couldn't tell her all that it meant. I knew that it meant something, but I didn't know that it meant everything. The resurrection is our faith. And without the resurrection of Christ, we have nothing. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that we would hear the wonder of the resurrection afresh, or perhaps truly hear it for the first time. Father God, we pray that you'd give us faith to believe, We pray that the truth of the resurrection would direct and determine everything we do. And so we pray that we would live in obedience, believing that this life is not all that there is. And we pray that we would live in hope, believing that a better life is coming. We pray that we would live in joy, believing that all things will become new. We pray that we would live in boldness, believing that you will vanquish our every enemy. We pray that our faith would not be in vain. We pray that our faith would be shown genuine in the way we live because of what we believe about the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen.